All right, everybody, welcome. Thanks for joining us. We are gonna go ahead and get started. I'm sure that we'll have some folks joining us uh, in the next few minutes. But welcome, thanks for joining us live today. Uh, we're gonna be talking about candidate and employee experience considerations for today, especially through the lens of employer brand is what we're gonna be focusing on. And before I introduce our guests today, uh, first thing is just talk about a little bit about housekeeping about this webinar. Like many webinars that I'm sure that you've been on, we will be recording this session. We will make it available to you all as well as the deck tomorrow. Um, if you have questions throughout the webinar, please submit them either through the question and answer portion of the Zoom dashboard and or the chat function works too. So either way, I've got my team member on, Ron Mockhammer, who will help um, with questions as we get towards the end of the webinar is when we'll take those and appreciate your patience. So without further ado, let me introduce our guests that we have today. So we have Antonio Lopez, who's a, the talent acquisition leader, and also an HR transformation at NATO, just that little global organization that keeps us all safe. Right, Antonio? Say hi. Hello. Yeah, there that's go. me. That's, <laughs> that's you. That's right. And we're really excited. So thanks for have, being on today with that. And also we've got Jason Moreau, the CEO of Surveil. Hi, Jason. Hey, good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Yeah, exactly. And I'm Kevin Grossman, president of Talent Board and the Candidate Experience Awards. And we've got a great presentation ahead. So the first thing that I want to do um, is just really briefly talk about Talent Board for those who aren't familiar. Talent Board uh, is the first nonprofit research organization all about um, elevating and promoting a quality candidate experience. Over the past nine years, we've been doing this benchmark research with employers big and small across industries. And then for those companies who have the highest positive candidate ratings solely based on the data and the research, we give them awards, hence part of our namesake, the Candidate Experience Awards. Our program is open, just a quick plug for it. Uh, it, there's no deadline to start, just a deadline to finish. It's a great way to benchmark your candidate experience against other companies, big and small, across industries. And it is open now through September 30th. So you have to be done by then, not start by then. So there's more information on our site at thetalentboard.org. We also want to thank, of course, Jason and Surveil, who's one of our underwriter sponsors, as well as the Candy Survey Platform. They're the ones that power the candies, and we wanna thank them and give them a big shout out as well. And Jason will talk later on in the webinar about continuous feedback measurement of your candidate and employee experience. All right, so first what I wanna do is I've just got some, a little bit of uh, kind of to kick things off, a little bit of insights that I wanna share from the talent board and from the candies as we like to call it for short. First, I wanna talk about this part. And I say it like that because this is a very, very overwhelming times today, globally. As wherever you're at today, you probably know somebody who's obviously been impacted by A, COVID-19, coronavirus, and potentially even impacted not only from a health, perspective, but also economically. Um, many companies have, and organizations have, put the brakes on hiring, they've frozen hiring, they've re reduced hiring, they've laid off, they've furloughed, uh, the, the list goes on. So right now it's a very, it's not just for candidates, it's a very scary time, but for obviously for current employees as well at many different organizations. And how companies respond today to your candidates, to your employees, how you're consistently communicating with them will impact your business and your brand, not just for months to come, but for years to come. We've been doing this research for candidate experience now in a growth, solely growth market for over nine years until this year. So um, that we will continue to, to do this research and it's important that we, again, think about the candidate experience as well as the employee experience. They both over, they both go hand in hand and intertwine. So real quick, th this is kind of an ongoing survey that we've been doing. We actually are launching a new one today, but since the beginning of March or middle of March, we've been asking companies what they're doing as it relates to responding to COVID-19 and as it relates to the impact on their recruiting and hiring. 
So just as since we're talking more about employer brand today, I wanted just to share that when we asked at the beginning of April versus um, through the middle of May, uh, do they are you putting some kind of a statement on your career site to let candidates know what you're doing as an organization? Are you still hiring? Are you not hiring? How are you keeping new employees safe? Whatever those statements are, I've got some examples I'm going to share next. But so what was good to see was that uh, uh, it increased uh, about 17% from the beginning of April through the middle of May, about 35% or a third of companies who responded to these. This is kind of mini surveys as an addendum to our benchmark research that we do. Um, and so and it was about 121 companies versus 138 the first time in this series. Anyway, about a third said that they were doing something on their site. So that, for example, these are some brands, companies who have been candy winners as well in our research, that there's different statements about what they're doing, if they're hiring or not, uh, how they're responding as an organization that they're putting right on their career site. So candidates can see and, and understand of whether they are hiring or not, are they hiring for essential workers still? Are they still capturing applications or just letting people know, listen, we're not hiring now, but thanks for stopping by. And then some other examples from some healthcare organizations as well. Um, again, answering those questions on the career site. And, you know, I wish it was higher than a third of the companies saying that they're doing this, but I think it's important that, that, that uh, what, what public facing message you're putting out there for your candidates and your employees. Now, based on our core research that we do, um, we know that companies who have an NPS, a net promoter score of 50 or higher, and the way that we view net promoter, we do a lot of different four and five point scale ratings that we can convert easily to net promoter, but anything above 50 is actually a really good, is an amazing score for that matter, especially when we're dealing with most of the responses in our research are are um, rejected candidates. So in the research phase, we know that companies who have NBS is a 50 or greater, they're talking about more information about their company culture, employee testimonials on their website, more information about diversity and inclusion um, is what we see in our, in our data and research. And also, of course, these all underscore the values at an organization. Um, and now, Again, going back to the message, the slides I just shared, also how you're responding as an organization to this pandemic that we've been experiencing today as well. We also know that those companies who have the highest positive candidate ratings in our research, um, when it comes to an employment brand, recruitment, marketing, kind of you know, top of the funnel, vantage point, they're providing most of the time about 19% better available information Again, all those things I just shared, testimonials, values, DNI, et cetera. They're also um, offering about 25% more advocacy programs, meaning that you know, putting your employees to work to help you share the brand and evangelize the brand and to talk about why they like working there and why other folks should, should consider working there. And then they have a much higher relationship NPS, meaning that their candidates are 42% more likely to want to do something again with the brand, even if they don't get hired when they've applied. And that means they're willing to apply again. That means they're willing to refer others. And for consumer-based organizations, that means that they're willing to make purchases or influence them. So that just gives you, I wanted to give you a little bit of a window insight into some of the data. Um, lastly, these key competitive differentiators we've seen historically today, I don't, anticipate that these really will, will vary even today in this new realm that we're in as it relates to the impact of, of COVID-19 on um, recruiting and hiring, but consistent communication from pre-application to onboarding, setting better expectations with candidates, asking them for feedback, not just in like, for example, in our benchmark research, but continuous feedback that Jason's going to talk about. Um, uh, providing feedback, especially to final stage candidates, if you're not going to hire them, why? Just a little bit of job fit qualification, being more transparent, and then all these things can help improve the level of perceived fairness of the candidate, which is really what's key at the end of the day. So 
I'm going to be quiet now. I'm going to turn things over to um, Antonio from, from NATO. Hi, Antonio. All yours. Hi, Kevin. Thank you. So, yeah, uh, thanks for, for having me over. I'm, I'm keen to, to spend some minutes today with you to talk about um, how do we manage our employer brand um, in these situations that we are all in. So we're talking about lockdowns. We're talking about companies that are suffering financial losses. Um, it's not an easy time for, I think, most people. So you've spent, as a business, a decade or years or however long you may have building the brand, your employer brand, your consumer brand. So now what do you do? And um, this is where this nice Plymouth uh, comes in. So this is the outline for today. Um, first, we have a quick look. We've all been reading the news, but just a quick look at the economic side of, of COVID-19. Um, we then move on to the employer brand, consumer brand, um, where do they meet or where do they diverge. Then we can have a look at how does the kind of experience impact your employer and your consumer brands. Um, and then uh, we, we just have a quick look at what, what a business is doing, um, some do's and don'ts, uh, and how, how this may be an opportunity actually for some businesses to stand out from an employer brand point of view, as well, of course, as uh, a consumer brand point of view. And then just a small conclusion. So where are we at now? Um, I just checked the figures a couple of days ago. We're globally at 6 million plus diagnosed cases of COVID-19. Um, and unfortunately, there's been over 360,000 deaths globally. Uh, we've got full lockdowns or partial lockdowns across the world. Some economies are thankfully starting to reopen, but we've pretty much frozen the economic machine across most industries. Um, still in many places the situation is getting worse um, unfortunately so you've got countries like Russia Brazil or India where they are seeing increasing day-to-day -day infection and death rates um, and of course if we look at the economy the first impact we've got here is unemployment we've got mass layoffs and, and furloughs all over the globe um, of course, looking at unemployment data is not so easy because different countries have different measurements, but here are three countries that I think have striking figures. Um, you've got the US with a 14.7%, which I think is the April uh, data, we'll soon see May. Um, Germany with about 6%, it used to be about 3.5 before this whole thing started, so that's basically a duplication in a couple of months. Um, and that doesn't include the furloughed um, folks which are in, in what they call in Germany Kurzarbeit. The UK has a similar situation, it's gone to four on the official unemployment stats which will take months to reflect the impact but they already have about I think eight or nine million people on, on furlough and, and subsidized salaries. Um, the job adverts which I think is, is for us as recruiters um, quite a striking figure. There is a 50% reduction um, in, in the amount of jobs that have been advertised. I think I saw some data from Indeed. Um, and there are also reports that some salaries are falling, uh, starting to fall in some areas. So this is a, a nice uh, slide I, I borrowed from, from Zurich. So what are the possible um, um, risks that are ar arising from, from the current situation? So you, we may have a prolonged recession. We don't know where this is gonna go that may cause bankruptcies from both big firms and SMEs, uh, industry consolidation, um, more efficiency on, on that area, failure on, on, on entire industries or even countries to properly recover. So you may see bailouts, you may see uh, countries defaulting on their debt. Um, there are high levels of structural unemployment um, in, and, and in the youth there is a risk that this becomes a, a long lasting effect. Um, you may have some, some restrictions on the movement of people and goods that will go on longer than we all expect. Here in Europe, we're, we're hearing that maybe in the middle of June, we are able to travel from country to country, but we still don't know. Um, and if we look at the global picture, I think it's gonna take much, much longer. There's also, if we look at the macro aspect, um, the fiscal position in some countries is, are starting to, to deteriorate very, very rapidly. Um, and of course, if we look at, the, at some of the businesses and some of, of the products that are being traded globally, there may be some issues that are supply chains. Um, I don't know if anybody has ordered anything in Amazon in Europe, but you will see there's been some, some changes, even though those guys are working very, very fast and well. 
So if we talk about consumer and employer brands, um, I, I prepared this slide to look at how they come together and how they diverge. So there needs to be um, a, a first bullet point here, which is about competition. You're competing with others when it comes to acquiring customers or talents. Um, and the way you compete with them in both cases, it has to be consistent. It has to be through time um, consistent. The decision to buy a product or a service versus the decision of starting a career at whatever company is one that uh, is pondered on, that takes time to decide, that has factors that involve uh, that discussion. So it is still a decision-making process that the brand is aiming to influence, be that consumer or employer brand. There are, I think, if we look at the consumer uh, side of things, but also at the employer brand side of things, there are increasingly transparent marketplaces. So if someone is looking for a job now versus how it was 15 years ago, you've got a lot of places like Glassdoor or Kununu or wherever you are in the world. There are a lot of places indeed. You can go have a look at what folks are reviewing the company about. And this is the same as shopping for something in Amazon. You go and look at those reviews and make your mind up. The same thing with the audiences. So you may be uh, having um, folks that are shopping for something that actually that company that is manufacturing this something is having jobs for. So you've got an audience that you're targeting for them to make that decision. And it could be that those audiences overlap, but of course, likely differ. So there is a study recently by Glassdoor that looks into how the, the, the audience is maybe different, even though maybe mass consume products um, there is a difference in where and how do you deploy your consumer brand versus the employer brand. So whereas your consumer brand may be on a, on a, on a B2C, uh, the mass media uh, or, or some mass market marketing, um, you would be doing something different with your employer brand. You would be much more targeted, you would be more focused. Um, in terms of, of the experience that you have as an employee or a customer, you also see differences that impact the brand. So your product experience is not the same as your employee experience. Product experience could be just, I don't know, trying a new type of drink in a restaurant one day over a period of 20 seconds and you decide if you like it or not. Whereas the employer brand is deeply affected by candidate and employee experience, which are far more long lasting uh, processes. And finally, the engagement with the, con the consumer brand is often short. So I just mentioned that, that drink in the restaurant. And the, 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 let's say the engagement with the employer brand is usually much longer for, for those employees and for those candidates. And it, it, will vary, it will vary over time as your experience with the company goes. So the candidate experience aspect in terms of the brands um, is one of impact. So for me, the, the way that we look at candidates uh, in a lot of, of businesses and even our public sector organizations, sometimes we look at them as customers. Um, there is a risk of alienation of, of that candidate, which is also a customer due to bad candidate experience. So in terms of, of survey, we have the work, great work that has been done by uh, the talent board that shows throughout the years that about 65% or so of candidates who had a bad candidate experience are going to be sharing that bad experience with their network. And that might have eventually an impact on how that network decides to buy your drink again or to buy your product again. So in terms of um, the generation of, of additional engagement, if you have also a good candidate experience, some of those candidates who were not your customers before may become customers. So there's, there's been a bit of work done on that as well in terms of research. Uh, speaking of research, we've got a couple of, of cases. Uh, one of them, I raised my hand, it's my own, so a bit of self-promotion. But I think the, the, the biggest one in terms of how detailed it was and how financially driven it was, was uh, the Virgin Media case in the UK in 2016. So that's where, where Graeme, the person who was uh, running recruitment at Virgin Media then, he decided to uh, spend a good piece of time with his senior leadership, with his finance folks, to actually narrow down how many millions of pounds they were losing because of bad candidate experience. For those of you who don't know Virgin Media, Virgin Media is one of the biggest telecom companies in the UK. So that is a, is a mass market 
uh, type of, of business, uh, hundreds of thousands of customers, millions if not, and they calculated they were losing about five million pounds a year, four or five million pounds a year, um, due to bad candidate experience because they had tens of thousands of candidates who were not feeling very, very well after applying to Virgin Media. The case at Typico is one that I, uh, a piece of small piece of research that I conducted myself last year when I was still running talent acquisition there. And um, it was not as detailed as the Virgin Media one because I could, because of commercial uh, issues, I could not disclose certain financial uh, aspects of it. But I can tell you that my estimation um, was that we could uh, eventually recuperate about two or three million euros per year in lost revenue because of poor candidate experience. And uh, Jason will speak later, uh, but we used Surveil then, and we still had a very good NPS. Uh, we were not a bad uh, business from a CX point of view, but still we found a couple of million euros in lost revenue that could probably be done something about. So that, that's a typical case. So if we look at what's going on right now, we've got a crisis, very, very big global crisis. Um, what are, what organization is communicating when it comes to to employer brand generally so in in, in a normal situation uh, the employer brand um, is influenced uh, by the brand personality uh, trait sincerity so if you look at research on this ramp on canning uh, have done a good job on that one um, the let's say that the trust and um, and the connection that you build with that brand is heavily heavily influenced by how you perceive that brand to be sincere so this affection uh, on the employer brand was positively affected also by excitement and sophistication. Um, and there was also some correlation uh, in terms of the negative um, effect on the ruggedness. So if you've got a business that is coming across as being sincere, uh, is coming across as being exciting and sophisticated, um, it, is, it is something that is built through um, through the brand. So in terms of um, employer brand, how do you measure this? Um, and, and what aspects have been influenced uh, in the employer brand side of things by COVID? Um, I'm quoting here some, some really cool research done by the folks at Link Humans in London. They came up with their employer brand index. They look at a, a variety of touch points in the brand uh, the companies kind of influence or not to to then move the brand one way or another, and they've seen massive changes through COVID in the last couple of months in in which aspects are important to talent and therefore important to companies. Um, they've seen that you know before balance and well-being was kind of there, it's kind of important, but now it's gone to the absolute top. So the majority um, of respondents to the survey highlighted balance and well-being as, as, a, as a key thing that matters to them. Remuneration has skyrocketed as well. Um, workplace topics have become very, very important to people. Um, and also the mission and purpose, uh, it's pretty much tripled in terms of what people consider important. So I thought this is an interesting slide to, to share. So, we're now in this crisis, what, what are organizations communicating now? So if you go and look at best practice, I didn't want to bother you with thousands of examples, but this is a small summary. They're communicating how they look after the well-being of the staff, and it links with the previous slide. This was the biggest thing for, for talent. They're communicating how they support the staff financially. They are, in my opinion, doing way more frequent updates, both internally, but also externally in terms of what the company is doing, what is the outlook, what are the measures being taken, how are we looking after the staff, sharing some bits of, of work-life balance uh, tips, some health tips, how is the business looking after uh, the colleagues. They're also thanking the workforce, particularly the frontline companies, people have uh, colleagues in the frontline, uh, there's a lot of, of gratitude that is displayed publicly and their community, uh, the community work that is being done by those businesses and the donations are also being made more visible. So again, talking about how are companies projecting their brand at the moment, what are companies talking about right now? This is some interesting data from LinkedIn themselves. 
um, about COVID-19. So what is the percentage of, of company posts that were about COVID-19? There was nothing, of course, before January, but it's just become you know, 20, 26 percent. This data goes all the way into the middle of April. So interesting to see what the LinkedIn folks have to say about the last six weeks. I think it goes to show that COVID-19 has taken over the center stage. So which industries are posting most about COVID-19? You've got legal that has become very, very heavy at the beginning on it. The public administration, and I uh, work for, for a public organization. Um, I can tell you the work that's been done at NATO in terms of uh, flying supplies, uh, alliance uh, work in terms of intelligence sharing and best practice sharing. It's been incredible. And we're sure as a business to portray this publicly uh, because the, uh, the citizens have the right to know where is the taxpayer money going to and what are we doing with it. So there's lots that's being discussed in this. Healthcare organizations are, are doing the same. Um, nonprofits and public safety, those are the, the, the five key sectors that LinkedIn saw. Again, with the LinkedIn data, um, there was, of course, this wave of posts about working from home. Um, I think we've all seen a lot of webinars and a lot of posts about working from home, tips, do's and don'ts. But, you know, this data is spectacular. There was uh, very, very little activity on LinkedIn about this topic until the beginning of February. And then it was just wow. Some interesting uh, data as well in terms of the engagement um, on, on the posts related to COVID-19. Uh, the engagement was up through the last months, um, but it's interesting to see some, some geographical uh, diversity. You've got Asia Pacific there. That was of course quite early on for obvious reasons. Then the rest of the world started catching on. And uh, yeah, you see that the, 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 the biggest amount of engagement on COVID-19 posts was in the North American region. The same thing about working from home. Um, our Asian uh, brothers and sisters have uh, taken the lead early on. And um, actually, the Americans, North Americans, are, are catching up with it. Latin America seems to very slowly follow the rest. In terms of LinkedIn data, so those posts that were highly engaged on LinkedIn, what did they contain? So what, what are they about? They were, of course, about helping. They were about people. They were about employees. They were about taking care. There was tribute to healthcare workers and health authorities. There was social distancing mentions and, and health warnings and issues. And there was a lot of talk about support. But those were the key keywords, according to LinkedIn. So a bit of text on, on do's and don'ts after all those graphs. So if you're, if you're looking after your employer brands, and you're doing some recruitment marketing or you're doing some external communication that is going to impact how your business recruits. Um, so you need to think about the tone of, of your ads and the status updates. So they may sit next to some horrible news um, and you need to be very mindful of, of how you're typing and you're projecting that brand. You don't want to be coming across as unrealistic and insensitive with some super happy office pictures when actually your entire staff is sitting at home on furlough. So it's not business as usual. Um, you need to showcase what the business is doing as well. If, if you're doing something to help in this situation, even if you're you know, a small chain of restaurants, what, are you, what is your business doing to protect your customers, to protect your employees? You need to be transparent. You need to communicate internally and externally, definitely, and regularly. And it's not a one size fit all advice. So you need to consider um, what your audience may want to hear because perhaps that restaurant chain has a very different audience than an automotive parts reseller. So it's maybe not the time for a fun post and instead focus on how you are projecting stability or ensuring stability. There's also something on visuals. So again, if people are staying inside, even if you're opening a new office, perhaps now is not the time to boast about it. Perhaps it's good to wait a few months. And this is where a lot of businesses have started using some authentic user-generated content. So a lot of staff videos, I think Walmart has done a great job on that. Uh, there's a lot of staff videos going around on how people are helping each other in the communities. So finally, this is also an opportunity to stand out. So COVID is a crisis, but 
uh, the businesses who can afford it should step it up and they are stepping up so they can do free food free rides uber has done a great job here in europe with this for healthcare professionals um, there are businesses who are also downsizing but you can downsize in a human way uh, as much as that is a, a difficult process so you can be honest you can be empathic and you can communicate properly to your staff and to the public and one example that i personally liked was airbnb it's a note from from the ceo they just let go i think about 20 25 percent of people and he just says you know i'm very very sorry this is really not your fault um and it's it's just a very thankful note um and it's a very personal note i very much like this one by airbnb so again don't throw away your hard work in building your employer brand be mindful of the overlaps between the consumer brand and the employer brand and be sensitive, uh, but also authentic, and keep the communication flowing. Um, and I think there's one for all of us to reflect in the future. Personally, I believe that in the next couple of years at least, candidates are gonna be asking you in your interviews, what did your company do in, in COVID-19? What do you do during the lockdowns? How do your company behave? And that's the kind of stuff they're gonna be looking after in, uh, in Glassdoor or Kununu or Indeed or one of these review sites. So that's it for me. All right, Antonio, thank you so much. That was great. And if, if you've got questions for Antonio, we'll take those after this next segment that we're going to do. And we'll definitely have time for all questions and answers. But now I want to turn it over to Jason Moreau, who's going to talk about continuous candidate and employee feedback. Jason, it's all yours. Thanks, Kevin. Hey, Antonio, thank you very much. That was, that was really informative. And, you know, that last point that you just hit there about what you do now as an organization will have a huge impact. I truly believe that statement. And, you know, that would be one of the questions I would ask my next employer as well is like, you know, how did you handle it? Did you for a little lay people off? Did, were you able to sustain? So that's really important. And, and that's kind of what I'm going to focus on here today as well as you know, using feedback from your candidates, uh, whether you're still hiring or not, uh, as well as your current employee base. So, you know, when I talk about feedback, I talk about feedback in micro stages and um, you know, the stages, you know, are still remain the same, you know, pre COVID post COVID during COVID all the hiring stages remain the same. It's just some of these stages have been really disrupted right now and companies have to change. You're forced to change certain areas in your hiring process or even as an employees. And you really need to understand through feedback, you know, how that's impacting either your candidates, your employees, or all of the above. And, and, you know, whether there's good things happening or negative things happening, you need to, the only way you can find that out is by asking for feedback from those particular individuals. And that's where stage-based feedback comes into to play here. So, um, Kevin, next slide. So, in our world, we view feedback in kind of four different pillars. The first pillar is the, the career site area. So, asking your candidates before they've even applied to a position. You know, what do you think about our employer brand? Um, how is it, you know, navigating our career site and so forth? And this is one of those areas that's had, you know, career site disrupted the, you know, the, the physical paper industry and the whole application pro industry, you know, 20 years ago, roughly. So now we're starting to see other areas in these uh, pillars here being disrupted. And then the second pillar is, is the post apply. So after candidates find requisitions and jobs, they apply to them on your career site. They start going through various hiring stages. And these are some of the stages that have been big time impacted with this COVID and rework, work from home uh, environment. And then the, the, the third stage is post hire. So, you know, and this is a really big one here. So understanding, you know, what your offers are like, you know, doing them virtually, uh, as well as your onboarding now is completely virtual. So that, that to me is probably one of the biggest areas that's being disrupted right now. And obviously, you know, you have your video interviews um, happening and no longer face-to-face -face interviews, but you know, that onboarding, I, I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be challenging to help uh, onboard and train all these employees remotely as we kind of ramp back up. And then ongoing employee experiences, the, the fourth pillar that we look at, you know, being able to send out sequences to your ongoing employee base, you know, whether you're asking for feedback or just saying hello, um, it, it's really important to communicate 
uh, as well as being able to come in on a, on a weekly basis and, you know, understand what that town hall meeting was like and we're, we're all working remotely. You know, we see clients now asking, you know, how's your wellness? You know, are you feeling, feeling positive or you're feeling like, oh, this is, you know, this isolation is really getting to me. Uh, we're starting to see clients wanting to understand whether they can turn their physical office locations now into hot seats. So I find this really interesting. You know, what percentage of you were working from home pre-COVID and now we're all working from home. Are you feeling more productive or less productive? How are you feeling like not having those colleagues' physical interactions? Um, really understanding, you know, that kind of uh, preparedness at home. Do I have the equipment and desks and so forth? So. It's really important to understand all this kind of stuff. So you can go to the next slide now, Kevin. So when I talk about stage-based feedback, I'm not gonna get into too much detail on these, but you know, the career site feedback is more digital experience, uh, how they're using your, your career site, understanding a little bit about your brand. And then, you know, as soon as they drop an application into your applicant tracking system, you know, everyone's apply pages are slightly different. Some are really long and, and you know, probably not so strategic anymore, but um, you want to understand what that apply experience was like from, from these technologies, because some of them are outdated and some of them need to be upgraded. Uh, your video screens and video interviews, you know, these are two areas that have been disrupted. Um, maybe less so on the video screen, on the phone screen kind of things, on, on the talent acquisition side, but certainly when it comes to interviews, the, the on-site interviews have gone next to zero and have completely gone online now. Um, so that's really important to understand what that connection is like, not just like a physical connection, but you know, what is the, 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 do I feel like I understand what this organization is trying to tell me and communicate to me? And do I understand like how this, this company feels and lives? I mean, you can no longer bring in people to your, you know, wowing facility. You know, we've seen some facilities, Kevin, when you go, I, you know, and I go in these workshops, some of these organizations just have mind blowing workspaces you know full-on gymnasiums full-on kitchens and, and you you know now you're doing these interviews that used to be one of your big draws to help attract candidates and talent <laughs> how do you how do you how do you relay this now in a video you know you're, you're not walking around your house showing your gymnasium <laughs> so um you know so that's those are some of the things that we're, we're challenged with and and need to uh, adjust in how we present this kind of stuff and then obviously, obviously you know, we move into the virtual offers and declines. Um, I think some of this was already happening, a lot of like through email communication and so forth. But there's also still some of the physical offers that would happen. And then I think, you know, the elephant in the room is really the, the virtual onboarding of employees. I mean, I just can't imagine, you know, at Surveil, we're 100% cloud-based and we onboard remotely. And it requires a lot of video calls that, that are hours on end. You know, I, I can't imagine how you do this on a scale of, okay, I need to go ramp up and bring on a hundred people today. Or what about a thousand? <laughs> I mean, it, it's really something that organizations need to be thinking about right now. So whether you're asking for feedback right now, so, so we have some, obviously some organizations are still continuing to hire and, and, and bring people on. And then we have some organizations that are not, they're on hold. But, you know, so whether you're in either place, you should either be thinking about what changes do I need to do to get myself ahead of this on virtual onboard, or if I'm in it right now, you know, I've got to pivot real time and understand, you know, where do I, uh, what do I need to do and what's, what's working, what's not working. And the only way you can find these things out are by asking your new hires. So I think that's a really big, big takeaway in this environment. So. Um, just moving along, you know, obviously quality of hire, um, you know, sorry, Kevin, you can go ahead. You can move on. So some of the, the, you know, by asking for feedback at these little micro stages, you know, when you sit back after, you know, whether it's three months or six months, you know, you can come in and, and start analyzing some of your dashboards and metrics and so forth. So everything from your career site, net promoter score, through the onboarding and new hire, um, understanding really quickly at a visual glance, you know, where do I have issues? what's working, what's not working, and it allow you to drive into the data. So other areas, you know, by asking for feedback. So I'm, right now I'm just kind of going into like, here's some of the benefits of asking for feedback at various stages. And this is just one of the stages. This is an interesting one. Um, this is on exit uh, satisfaction with one of our clients. 
And, you know, there's a way to get ahead of this. And then there's also a way to, you know, analyze it post, um, you know, tenure. So in this case here, the, the company, when they started asking their employees, why did you leave? You, you know, this one here was really eye opening. They weren't leaving because of salaries or incentives. They were actually leaving because the role has changed. And when I interviewed and accepted that offer and began my employment, you know, things changed. And that is no longer the job that I thought it was, thought it was going to be. And I don't have the tools and resources to do it. So I know. So that, that there to me is just like really eye opening in feedback. And, you know, off, I think often people think when people leave is because of salary incentives, right? And, you know, this is just a, a an area that, you know, by asking, it's eye opening, like, oh, wait a second, Let, let's sit back and really understand what we're doing here. Um, another one of these, you know, this is super important, just gets back to your employer brand. And we had a client that operates in four different regions and, um, you know, one of their regions, their employer brand w was tarnished. Um, you know, essentially, you know, your employer brand is responsible for your pipeline, right? Um, that's the simplest way I can explain what um, the importance of an employer brand is. And in India, this company uh, had struggled to attract talent. So they're having to offer more higher salaries, they had to pay more to recruit and advertise and, and build that funnel. Well, what ended up happening was we went and took a look at, you know, analyzed some of the data, like, you know, where are we struggling here? Why is your brand being tarnished in India and nowhere else? And, you know, really quickly we dove into interview feedback with managers and it's not to pick on managers here. Not all managers are poor, but, um, in this case, we were able to identify like, you know, who's wasting people's time, for example, was one of the questions. And, and really quickly, we, we discovered there's three particular managers in this division that were just basically not prepared. They didn't understand the role, what they're doing. Their, their interviews were just terrible. They're wasting people's time. And that's the number one complaint from candidates is, you know, don't waste my time. I, I've taken time out of my day to come visit you. I, you know, maybe I've taken a PTO day over here. Um, don't waste my time, you know, be prepared. Uh, I'm a talented individual and I want to work for you. So, uh, anyhow, we identified that they went and trained, retrained those managers on how to interview, how to be prepared. And, you know, six months later, their employer brand scores were ramping up ahead of some of the other regions, which is really interesting. So, um, that's the importance of, I think, you know, understanding all these different stages. Um, other areas, you know, if you're asking your managers and your team about the uh, new hires, you know, understanding, you know, are they as productive as you think they should be? Are they exhibiting the skills? So I understand the quality of hire, you know, then you're able to start interestingly, you know, map that quality of hire metrics back to what sources are providing us that those good qualities, um, good candidates. Is it LinkedIn, Glassdoor, or maybe it's this other job board that, uh, you know, produces a lot of hires, but you know, our managers are telling us that they're all poor. Um, so let's reallocate our budget uh, accordingly. So this would kind of a more like big role of re reallocate budgets uh, um, annually. And then, you know, with Surveil, we, we like to um, benchmark questions against the talent board research. You know, we think it's really important that you need to understand, you know, how likely are you to refer some of the work here? You know, what do I look like against all the participants of the talent board and what, what are the winners of the talent board? What kind of scores? So in real time, understanding you know where you situate um, against talent board participants which gives you an indicator on how well your organization really is performing and then based on that you know uh, and this is just a little bit of a, like what we like about our technology is, is uh, you know based on how people are feeling about those interviews or or onboarding or whatever if they're having a positive impact uh, the system will also say hey you know will you go leave us a glass door score because we know how important the glass door scores are. So everything you can do to boost those scores will help drive and reduce costs of recruit, recruiting and your acquisition of employees. So I think this is a really important one. And, and I, I, you know, companies that have lower scores, you know, have to pay more in recruiting and in salaries and so forth. So it's, it's as simple as that. So the, uh, the just kind of ending this presentation is, you know, doing like pinpointed automated um, stage-based feedback, it moves you from the situation of like, oh, I think it's this manager, I think it's this region, this department, to actually pinpointing the real issue. And, and by pinpointing the real issue, 
you know, you, it allows you to adapt quicker um, in real time, make adjustments. And, and, and it's so important, I think, in this current situation that all of a sudden, if the economy just opens back up, well, it's everyone's fighting for the, that top talent that has just been laid off or furloughed. Like, you know, don't just think that <laughs> because you furloughed people that they're coming back to your organization. <laughs> um, you know, so you want to get ahead of it and you need to be ready and you need to have really good processes because um, they've been disrupted, some of them, and you need to be able to be ready to understand where you need to adjust in real time. So, you know, it all comes back to trying to enhance our employer brand, build that big funnel uh, of talent and moving through those various stages. So with that, uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Kevin. Um, we love working with you guys and so informative. Turn oh, thank you, Jason. That was a great, great way to end this. So real quick, and then we're gonna take some questions. We've got resources on our site. You can even go to the talentboard.org. It's linked on the homepage as well um, about different important resources about the impact of what's been going on on your organization's recruiting and hiring. We're also part of an initiative um, called Recruiters Recruiting Recruiters, which is a place where uh, companies who are still hiring for talent acquisition professionals can go and find a pool of those who have been laid off and or, and or furloughed and uh, it's a great collaborative initiative that we were a part of, that Jason um, from Surveil has been a part of, and, and many other organizations. So those are two resources for you, and we'll send the links to you as well. Um, and then uh, our, all of our research is free to download on our site. All of our resources um, are free on our site at thetalentboard.org. We've got some virtual workshops coming up that you can find on our site um, where we're gonna do some even more peer-led discussion groups as well. And then of course our program is open for companies who do want to benchmark their candidate experience. And um, again, communication and feedback, always perennial important uh, to be focused on from year after year. So I've got, so if you've got questions, post them now in the chat and or the Q and A part of the Zoom dashboard. But Antonio, I've got a, a question for you. Can you talk about how, a little bit more specifically about NATO's approach. I mean, when this all happened, what happened with your recruiting and hiring? How are you yeah. communi how are you communicating with your candidates and employees? And and that said, what do you recommend one thing that companies should be doing today if they're not? Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, no, sure. Um, well, NATO NATO is a very particular organization in many ways. Um, and I think that our role in, in, in the COVID situation is also a particular one. So we have continued recruitment. We've done everything we could to keep business as usual. So that, that was uh, what actually took a lot of energy from, from, from our teams, our recruitment teams um, at the beginning of March. It was very difficult because NATO historically is a very uh, paper-based organization. I'm not gonna lie. So there was a lot of processes that had to be digitized very, very quickly. Um, but you know, people rose to the challenge, um, and it's been, yeah, I've I've been on paternity for 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 a while and and took some time off. So I don't know I don't know much about how the situation is at the moment, but but it's been it's been good. Uh, the first few weeks when I was there, it was, it's been good. It's worked. We've moved everything online. Final interviews are happening online. Um, our IT folks have done an excellent job to enable secure communications on that one, and. Um, the I think the key challenge here is how do you onboard um, folks that are essential staff? So think about, for example, an intelligence section. Th those are not people that can work remotely. If somebody is um, analyzing and disseminating intelligence, highly classified materials, those people cannot be working through a VPN sitting in I don't know, Montana or uh, the south of France. So for those folks we've had to really break down some of the tasks um look at ways of getting them to to hq or to whatever their post may be so it's been really um a customized approach for those for the majority of people who are able to work remotely we've we've enabled them to to start remotely so for example the nato communications and information agency uh, has done an excellent job on that one um and if I had to say one thing that all, all businesses have to be doing at the moment is, is just communicate. Communicate constantly with your candidates, with your hiring managers, touch base, 
um, if you're not hiring just pipeline. So if, if for whatever reason you've been you've been put in a hiring freeze, but you know that the moment that freeze is lifted, there are going to be 10, 15, 20, whatever many roles that you're going to have to be filling urgently because the business is hurting no matter what. Now is the time to, to do some pipelining. So don't, don't let the phones go uh, quiet, I would say. There's been many bodies of research along those lines, especially as it relates to more of the corporate side marketing that companies that continue to invest in promoting their brand, so their consumer brand, obviously, and their employer brand, um, are going to have definitely have more of a competitive edge to those that put a full stop to everything and then just not say a word. Yep. Yeah. Not, I think that, that, that there's been many bodies of research, and I think we're going to find that now with many, you know, whether it's, you know, NATO or very large retailers or, you know, look at the industries that have been completely decimated, travel and leisure, for example, um, yep. and how they're trying to, to continue to, to come out of that hole. J Jason, I had a question for you. So we, the talent board research that we run is the annual benchmark. So companies are doing point in time research with a population of candidates yep. that getting their feedback. Um, and then in conjunction with, you know, what the next step would be to do that continuous feedback, what's the kind of, what frequencies are you recommending to organizations? So I, what I mean is, is like when you highlighted some examples of when you could ask for feedback, but how often should I be asking for feedback? What's, what's yeah. one of your recommendations there? Well, you know, definitely obviously your career site, you know, that, that's your first frequent. And then, you know, that I would definitely move into, you know, the phone screens, understanding what your talent acquisition team is doing. Everyone's remote right now. Uh, and then again, after interviews. And, you know, each of these particular stages, you want to kind of wait 24 hours, 48 hours before you reach back out and mm -hmm. ask for feedback. So, so on average, it's usually two to three days, you hold back. And then as soon as they onboard, you know, you want to get in front of your, you want, A, you want to send out a welcome email mm -hmm. to, to your new hire, like two hours after they started their, their, their job. And then again, five days, you should check in and say, hey, how was that first five days? You know, I know you're working from home. Do you have the equipment you need? You know, like you can even back that one up even to two or three days. It's so important, uh, you know, at this particular juncture right now. And then again, you want to do a little more frequent check-ins, you know, again, at 30-day mark. Um, you know, tell us a bit more and then, you know, then the, the, the cadence, you know, just becomes a little bit greater uh, at each particular area. Good. Thank you for that. Ron, did we have anything else? I've got one more question for Antonio, but any, anything else from the, uh, from the attendees? We have not. I think that'd be a great question for Antonio. Um, no, I think you guys did an amazing job explaining everything. So great job, you guys. Um, you no further questions. So Antonio, you, you wrote a little paper. Mm -hmm. Right, a little yeah. paper, a little <laughs> research paper about candidate experience. Can can you tell us more about that? Sure, uh, that was my um, master's thesis for my executive MBA at uh, the Frankfurt School of uh, Finance and Management. So it took me a couple of months of intense work with uh, yeah a lot of sleepless nights. My my kid was uh, seven or eight months old back then, so it was it was tough, and I was working at the same time, but. It was a great opportunity to, to kind of bring together the knowledge I was gaining from my executive MBA with my tasks at Typico, looking after that employer brand and starting to measure it and to do something about our candidate experience and the need to actually come up with, with, with a master's thesis. So I put all of that together, spent those couple of months, and um, the results were quite interesting. As I said before, I was not able to disclose Right. Uh, commercial information like the uh, customer lifetime value of Typico. So for those of you who don't know the German betting market, uh, Typico is the biggest uh, sports betting company in Germany and Austria. So it has a massive market share, it's like 60% in both retail and online. So it's a definite market leader and it's a very fast paced digital uh, business. It has a very young uh, customer base as well. Um, and this type of, of market is extremely competitive. So if you think about um, an app where you can do some, some betting, what is the cost of switching from my app to my competitor's app? You just go on out the Apple store or whatever 
and download something in 30 seconds for free and, and off you go. So that was kind of um, the hook to start the research. The research in the end indicated that, um, and thanks to Surveil, uh, we measured um, our, our uh, candidate experience. The research indicated that we were not losing a lot of revenue from our, um, let's say, digital candidates. Mm -hmm. We were losing most of, of the revenue from the retail ones, and Typico was running a massive franchise network where the recruitment was not done by my team or by Typico itself. It was done by the franchisee. So we got to a point where we started getting a lot of negative reviews in Indeed, in Glassdoor, in Kununu, which is a German version of it. And, and, and those folks, which were very angry, they never got an answer, they were interviewed in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bad place or something, they were not being interviewed by us. They were interviewed by the franchisee. Mm. So that's where I took the case a bit further and I came up with the three million because the amount of, of shops under franchise were about 900. So there were, there were thousands of hires made every year under those shops, which we were not controlling. And that's kind of worrying when you're so carefully investing your brand to stand out against those other competitors that are right. so easy for someone to switch on. That's excellent. Thank you for sharing that, by the way. And just as one final note to everybody who's on and who will watch the recording, there is a free, well, many free resources on our site at thetalentboard.org, but you, we've also got a, a candidate resentment calculator mm -hmm. that you can plug in some data, your annual hires, um, how many applicants per hire it's taking, what your, what your estimated annual value of a customer is, even if you're a B2B company, um, which, where that, that kind of an impact is obviously not gonna be as immediate as a consumer-based company, it's still great food for thought to think about for those candidates who say through our research, uh, or, or even if you're doing continuous feedback, who's, who are basically saying, I don't ever wanna do anything with you again, ever what that potential impact could be on your business. So it's a free resource on our site. And I think that aligns with what you were just laying out. Well, but Antonio and Jason and Ron, thank you all so much. Uh, I think we're gonna wrap now. It's the top of the hour. So thanks again, everybody for joining us. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Take care.